Hello there, it's James B. Welcome to my podcast. It's a vodcast. It's a visual podcast. And uh, I'm going to tell you some things to do in the next week here in Toronto. And also, a little later, I'll be interviewing a great musician, also a guy who's knee-deep in the music industry. Uh, he books acts for the TD Toronto Jazz Festival. And his name is Josh Grossman, so he'll be up in just a bit. Right now, though, I want to start with a couple of quick thank yous. Thank you to Barbarian Steakhouse. Uh, they have been sponsoring this podcast. And sometimes soon I'll be doing some interviews in their steakhouse, in the wine cellar, in the attic, somewhere in the room. Uh, but lately we've been here in my home studio with this magical green screen. Ooh, did I give it away? You probably already know that. Anyway, Bill King will be on next week. Josh Grossman will be on this week. I love interviewing people and I love the support I get from Barbarian Steakhouse and from Paul Barber, barberfinancial.com. True story, I was in North Bay with Captain Paul I was up there uh, last week. We walked into this mall and a woman came up to him and said, are you Paul Barber? And he looked and he goes, do I know you? And she said, I need some financial advice. And I watched James B's podcast. And then he said, oh, that's James B over there shopping for some wooden fixtures. Anyway, it was pretty weird. And you never know who watches this podcast. So Thanks to all of our sponsors. Uh, Patreon.com is how you can sponsor. If you are a person and not a business, you can donate five bucks a month and it goes a long way. Five bucks a month and it helps. So if you want to do that, help me out. Patreon.com is where to go. Okay, listings. Lulalounge.ca. Lula.ca is where you could want to go. Uh, it is their uh, big Lula World Festival. They've been doing this for years. It's always jammed, so check ahead for tickets. Uh, tonight, Tres Estelas de Salsa. I'm actually going to be there early tonight. Uh, and DJ Suave, as always. Uh, Lula World continues until Sunday, and it's wrapping up with Kelly Lee Evans coming in. Last time I saw her, she was singing to a packed house at Kerner Hall. She is one of our great singer-songwriters and entertainers. Uh, so if there are tickets left, lula.ca. Check out all the listings over there. And at uh, Jazz Bistro, Colin Hunter is there tonight and tomorrow, along with the Joe Seeley Quartet. And then Joe Seeley sticks around on Sunday to back up Barry Callahan and Tabby Johnson. All right, and then uh, Chris, Ken, and Jesse Whiteley, the Whiteley clan, are on stage at the 18th at Jazz Bistro. And then the Cabaret Series is on. And so that's going to be a couple of weeks long. Uh, some performers include Maureen Kennedy, Charlotte Moore, June Garber, Stu Mack, at jazzbistro.ca for all of that. At uh, HughesRoomLive.com, let's take a look. Hughes Room Live. Oh, Sunday is the second part of the tribute to the Cabana Room and Jimmy Scopes, the late great Jimmy. Uh, it should be really interesting. And I hear rumor that Dave Howard of the Dave Howard Singers will be at Hughes Room doing a few songs and seeing him is a rare treat. So check it all out over there. What else is coming up? On the 19th, you can see a rare concert by Carol Pope. Remember Rough Trade? She uh, grabbed her crotch before Michael Jackson. I don't know if that's important, but she was a groundbreaking singer, and she's fabulous, and you can see her at Hughes Room Live. And uh, what else? Elizabeth Shepard is going to be there with Michael Acampinti, not till June 24th, but Elizabeth Shepard always sells out. So check out all the listings, but get yourself some tickets for uh, Shepard and Acampinti on the 24th of June. Old Mill Toronto tonight, Duncan Hopkins is there. He's always fantastic, a great bass player. Moved back here from England recently. Be nice to see him again. And uh, who else is there? Brian Blaine tomorrow. Next week, Bob DeAngelis, Heather Bambrick, and more information at oldmilltoronto.com. All the shows are 7.30 to 10.30 in the Homesmith Bar. Uh, what else is coming up? Oh, Cahill Zabar uh, and David Murray. If you have not seen Cahill El Zabar, I don't know what to tell you, except you need to go there and see this man. It is dreamy. It's brainy. It's heartfelt. It's really hard to describe. But you will be in a trance, and it's beautiful music. Caliban Arts Theatre is where you're going to get the information. CalibanArtsTheatre.com. It's at the Remix Lounge, and uh, I suggest you get there at uh, 7, 7.30. But get your tickets in advance because this thing sells out, I'm sure of it. Uh, Colin Hunter and the Starlight Orchestra are back at Palais Royale. I will be there June 22nd to benefit for Jazz FM. Uh, Combo Royale will open. There, I expect three, 400 people in there, and it's so nice out. So the patio will be open. You can dance in the patio, hang out and have a quiet drink, get on the dance floor, watch people dance, enjoy some nice snacks, 
Mmm, fish tacos. Anyway, it's going to be a great time. June 22nd, information at jazz.fm. And uh, the day after that, Adam James is at Luna Lounge with uh, the Jazz FM Youth Big Band. Young kids who know how to swing. So that's two parties in a row with big bands. The 22nd at Palais Royale and the 23rd at Lula Lounge. June 28th at the Horseshoe, Richard Flohill turns 85. I had him on my show last week. And if you haven't seen that, please check out the interview with Richard Flohill. And if you can't make his party uh, at the Horseshoe, where he turns 85 on June 28th, you can go to... Um, unisonfund.ca and you can still make a donation even if you can't make the gig because it is a charity event. Finally at the Rex, coming up in the next week, Barry Romberg, Bob Bruff, Pat LaBarbera, John McLeod, and the Toronto Jazz Orchestra is coming up in the next few days. Josh Grossman is the leader of that band and he's my guest. Coming up in about 10 seconds. Now I mentioned he is a trumpet player, composer, arranger, and one of the guys who books acts for the TD Toronto Jazz Festival. So, let's go see him now. Hello there. Hello. Hey, great to see you. <laughs> so Josh, before we get into all the amazing stuff you've been doing professionally to help other people, I want to start with your music. When did you get the bug? When did you go, I think I'm going to be a musician? Uh, I guess it was in between grade six and grade seven. Well, that's when the, the real trumpet bug started. So yeah. I went, my parents sent me to Pine River Summer Music Program, and it was my first overnight camp, and there was a trumpet there. And I picked it up, and it was like, I don't know, it was meant to be, or something like that. Well, you've had some amazing teachers. What was it like studying with Chase Sanborn? It was great. And, and the thing is, when I got to jazz school, they saw in me someone that had potential as a trumpet player, and as, a, as potentially a jazz trumpet player. And then I got to school, and Chase was like, all right, Here's what we got to learn. <laughs> so he was great for laying down the fundamentals of what it meant to play jazz because I just didn't have that much experience in that particular thing getting to school. Um, and he was fantastic. Like he, he took me through all of the basics of playing uh, jazz, helped me improve as a trumpet player as well. Um, and then when I got to, uh, to get to work with Kevin Turcott, I mean, that was a whole other thing too. I mean, Kevin is all about feel and swing and, and, and finding swing and blues and basically every style of music and every every approach to trumpet playing like where is it where does the swing where's the blues in there and, and so that it, was that was awesome too. it's fascinating to me because people don't really understand how much you can learn from someone talking about it i mean you just watch kevin turcott or chase sandborn play yeah and you know you want to study with them but the actual act of studying well, and every teacher is different, right? I mean, and, and, you know, Chase is a very enthusiastic teacher and he approaches, he's got lots to say all the time. I mean, Kevin, a lot of the time, he was just like, you know, let's just sort of play and listen. And you know, it's like, it, so it was slightly less, uh, uh, less verbal, maybe. Mm -hmm. So just to be around someone like that, though, to hear him play and to hear him talk a little bit about what he's thinking about when he's listening to certain things or what we sh what he wouldn't wanted me to listen to. I mean, that was, that was amazing without being kind of, really uh, over the top sort of pedagogically or, or right. something like that. Yeah. You know, so. uh, uh, Phil Nimmons also was uh, one of your teachers. Yeah. yeah, and continues to be an inspiration for me. I mean... 93, still playing. 96? 96. No, I, think, I think he's 96. <laughs> yeah, he just turned 96. Um, and Phil, I mean, he's, he's just a, an inspirational person overall. Um, and I remember being in second year university and playing in his big band and we had this gig at the, in the Arbor Room at Hard House and he counted the tune in and I totally came in in the wrong spot and he just looked back and he just laughed and that, I mean, that sort of, for me, captured Phil as a person. Like, look, let's just have a good time with this. Let's do it right. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not going to embarrass you in front of everyone. You know what happened. Exactly. Yeah. Let's, let's have a good time with this and his, his approach to everything, life, music, playing improv composition. I mean, it's just so positive yep. overall. So to have the opportunity to have work with someone like that. Now, you've done many size combos, but in particular, the 18-piece big band, the Toronto Jazz Orchestra. Right. When did you first decide, I know, I'm just going to have to have a big band? It was sort of towards the end of my schooling at the University of Toronto. Because we, at, at school, I had played this incredible repertoire in the big bands there that had kind of opened my ears to big band repertoire in a way that, that they hadn't been opened before. And as I was kind of surveying the landscape of the, of the jazz community at that time in Toronto, there weren't bands playing the music of Thad Jones and of Bob Brookmeyer and of you know Maria Schneider and people like that. So um, I said, well, if I'm going to play this music, I have to put together a band 
to play this kind of music. Right. And so that's, uh, that's what we did. And it started as students. We were all students. And we were rehearsing every Saturday morning at a Ray Music in Dufferin, like in Liberty Village before it was Liberty Village. Yeah. Um, and we were all just right into it. And over the years, it's progressed, and everyone's been busier and busier. And I think you're right that there's not a lot of people doing that, and there's a lot of people maybe trying to do Count Basie or Glenn Miller or something yeah. a little more popular. Yeah. I know you did do some Duke Ellington for a while though. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I mean, if we want to remember what swing is and where it comes from and that's yeah. you know you go back to duke and you go back to count basie and and all those amazing uh swing swing bands. what is it about thad joan mel lewis or maria shawty what is it about these artists that that resonates with you what well for, for thad in that band the thad jones mel lewis band etc etc um it was the combination of the swing tradition the big band tradition because of course he's the trumpet player that plays on april in paris right the count mm -hmm. basie band that that's mm -hmm. old I mean, that's thad jones yeah so that's where he's coming from but then he's putting on top of it all these amazing, crunchy, contemporary sounds. Uh, and so this sort of mishmash, this a lot of dissonance in there that really appealed to me, but still like absolutely swinging. And then Bob Brookmeyer comes along, you know, in my, in my learning, mm -hmm. uh, in my trajectory. And again, there's, he's taking it even further sort of into the contemporary classical thing, contemporary sounds, really different sounds. And again, my ears just kept getting open. More it's like they wrote it for you. Well, not exactly. <laughs> well, but <laughs> no, but the amount of familiarity to you, like well, this it. is what I that, love. Yeah. That's it. And so as the band has progressed over the years, what we've tried to, what I've done as the artistic director is try to find music that kind of resonates with me in that kind of way. So like Radiohead. Like Radiohead, for example. So, you know, um, it, it's funny, there's a band in, there's a school in Kansas and they did this Radiohead jazz project. So they commissioned some composers in the States to do arrangements of Radiohead music. And so they, uh, they, they put it together and they recorded an album. And I thought, well, that's sort of an interesting concept. So we took that concept and we took some of those charts that were created originally. And then I started reaching out to local composers and said, hey, we've got this thing. Do you want to do an arrangement of a Radiohead song? And it's awesome. <laughs> and now it's a whole band that it's, does just it, Radiohead. That's it. It's, it's mm -hmm. you know, we do it once or twice a year at the Rex. Um, and people come out and it's packed and we feel like rock stars and people sing along to the music and you know it's similar in some ways every once in a while we'll go to Dover Court House yeah. with the whole band and play for one of the swing nights and we'll play you know all that straight ahead awesome swing stuff and people dance their butts off and it's so fun right when you get that reaction from the audience and that interaction from the audience. And, the, and for you to go, you're just going to swing. That's it. The, the, That's your it. purist, just swing, make sure everyone dances at all times. There's no, there's no pretense here. Yeah. Like, this is a swing show. We're not going to try to sneak anything <laughs> in. That's right, because it's, like, it's not going to work. They don't bomb. Absolutely. <laughs> Same with Radiohead. Like, this is it. This is Radiohead yeah. music. Arranged for big bands. Are there other bands like that for you right now? Are there other bands like Radiohead that you go, oh, this is just meant to be mutated? I'd have to think about that. A little bit more, but what I'm really interested in is sort of uh, taking taking an MC and taking a beat maker and taking some big band composers and just like squishing them all together and, and see what happens. We did a show a couple of years ago. Uh, we brought in an MC and, and uh, we did a couple of arrangements. I, I arranged, you know, let your backbone slide for big band. And <laughs> awesome! <laughs> and it was like that that idea that you know, there's there's lots of interesting music being made in lots of interesting ways and to sort of mash them up in perhaps unexpected ways right. is fun. Now let's go into your biz for a sec. Yeah. I think your first big gig was the Glenn Gould uh, uh, studio. You were like managing director at the Royal Conservatory was, of Music. So I was, yeah, I was yeah. the performance manager for the Glenn Gould School, which is yeah. the professional training institute at the Royal Conservatory of Music. And again, there, I mean, similar to my, my schooling, uh, when I did my audition for U of T, I think they looked at the raw talent and said, I think we could do something with this. Mm -hmm. I, you know, the, my boss at the conservatory, I had never worked full time. Uh, my boss at the conservatory took a bit of a risk on me, but I think saw the potential. And it was, it was a fantastic job for me because over the four years that I was there, I learned about concert production. I learned about marketing. I learned about budgeting. I learned about basically almost every component of running a, a substantial organization, yeah. um, but without being the person in charge. So I was able to gain a lot of information without being Yeah, the stress was, was not as high. Yeah. <laughs> what about the High Park uh, choir, all yeah. the, kid, the kids' choir? Yeah, yeah. And so when I left the conservatory, I was, sort of wasn't sure what to do. And, and two things happened simultaneously. I met the artistic director for Continuum Contemporary Music. And she said, I'm looking for someone to help me with the administration. And I responded to a job posting for the High Park Parts of Toronto. They were looking for a manager. And so for a couple of years, I was doing these two part-time things. And 
again, you know, each was each was fantastic for its for its own reason. Um, Continuum I was actually with for ten years ultimately, and again, I ran the organization from the administrative side of things, so that was fantastic. Same with the choir. Did you also have to deal with the kids? With the choirs, absolutely. That's like, hundreds of kids. It was 120 choristers, I think, when <laughs> I was there. Whoa. But again, what, what kept me interested was, I mean, the choristers were great, and the parents were great. It was a very enthusiastic, lots of support for the organization. But mm -hmm. the artistic director, this woman named Zinfira Polos from Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. absolutely brilliant. And what she was able to get out of the kids, uh, the choristers of any age, uh, was unbelievable. The sound, but also the... The, uh, the discipline of singing in a choir and, and what it really meant to be sort of part of a larger ensemble and tone production and all that sort of stuff. I mean, wow. she, was, she was brilliant to, to work under. So. so you got to learn from a lot of people. And, and in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when people ask, like, well, how did you end up at the Toronto Jazz Festival? I said, well, it wasn't exactly a straight line. <laughs> no. No. In fact, you spent years over at the Markham Jazz Festival. That's right. Yeah. And I don't even know how many times we worked together on that. Years and years. Yeah. Um, where did that come from? I guess you, now you've got all of this background. Yeah, and, so. and so it was a combination of things. It was, it was in part running, it, I mean, primarily it actually came out of the big band because the mother of the baritone saxophone player was volunteering at the Markham Jazz Festival. She knew they needed a new artistic director. She encouraged me to, to apply. And then yep. so that's how it sort of went. But by that time, as you say, I had, I had picked up enough interesting experience that made me okay for the jobs. Now, when you come to the Toronto Jazz Festival, and this has been how many years now? This is my 10th festival. 10th festival. So I remember when you started, you were doing just the avant-garde side. Yeah, of the festival but, <laughs> at the very beginning. Well, and it was, yeah, and, and, and there were, when I started at the festival in 2010, I recognized there were things that, um, that had sort of fallen off the radar slightly of the festival, and I, I wanted to try to get those back. Some have been successful, <laughs> some less so, yeah. but at least, um, at least some efforts have been made, and, and we learn and we sort of move forward and try to do as much as we can, the best that we can. Yeah. Uh, it, not everything makes the cut, but... Well, there also must be a lot more uh, under a microscope when you're dealing with a Toronto festival than a small town festival yep. where you can pretty much try a few things and it's not the same things at stake. Well, that's it. That's it. I mean, the, the, the wonderful thing about working with the Markham Jazz Festival, it was a totally free festival. It was a small festival. The budgets were small. So there was, there was room for experimentation without the big risk. Yeah. Because we weren't spending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on artists, basically. Yeah. Uh, so I got to experiment with putting on all kinds of different styles of jazz um, and got to learn from the audience response like what works and what doesn't stuff like that mm -hmm. so with the Toronto Jazz Festival it's it's a different beast it's a big festival there are some big sponsors behind it and so you know we need to make sure that everything runs in a certain way to keep everybody satisfied and it's yeah. just on a, on a whole other level now now there are a lot of changes this year can you yeah. describe some of the improvements over the last couple of years well the big thing that we're doing this year is we're shutting down Bloor Street for opening weekend and this is really exciting for us we've been we moved into Yorkville uh, two years ago um, in uh, 2017 yeah 2017 and there were several reasons for doing that but what we didn't have at Nathan Phillips Square we didn't have an environment in which we could create a real festival from noon to 10 p.m. all day every day mm -hmm. and when we moved into Yorkville that really allowed us to do that we tripled the amount of free programming that we were doing um, we, we, we created this environment where people could come down at noon and literally just bounce around from stage to stage until 10 p.m. and see all kinds of different music all for free so that was huge for the festival. And as the artistic director, I had a lot more fun because suddenly I had 150 shows to program. Mm -hmm. So what could I do with 150 shows as opposed to, you know, only 50 or 60? Yeah. Um, so it's been really fun in that way. And we've tried to just build it up every year. And now this is the biggest splash that we've made so far. So we've always done a big opening weekend. This is the biggest. And this time you closed the streets down, right? Uh, yeah. So, so we'll have Bloor Street shut down from Avenue Road over to St. Thomas. We'll have a... a big marquee stage set up there. We'll have the 50th anniversary of the Down Child Blues Band playing with Dan Aykroyd and Paul Schaefer, etc., etc., etc. On Saturday night, uh, that's the 22nd. On the 23rd, we're starting off with a gospel thing. We'll have the Toronto Mass Choir and then Shirley Caesar. And then we move into Hip Hop Meets Jazz with Shad in the evening and Eloquent and, and Odyssey and Good Company and Melanie Charles. So it's like this big celebration of all things jazz and, yeah. and jazz related on and you're closing weekend. Cumberland now too Cumberland will be closed so last year we closed it for the opening weekend closing weekend it's mm -hmm. going to be closed for the full 10 days this amazing year. that is, that's huge it's it, it really is because last year the opening and closing weekends were great 
people came and everything like that, and people still came when it wasn't opening and closing weekend, mm -hmm. they just had the risk of being hit by cars. So right. we're, we're just trying to take that away. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Year. Especially when you could only fit so many people before the traffic. Like exactly. You, exactly. Right. Exactly. So, we'll, you know, we, we always have to leave a fire lane and, you know, boring logistics mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But it will just mean that the streets are open specifically for pedestrians. Uh, the park will be licensed to a certain extent, so you can come and grab a drink, listen to some great music on the Cumberland Street stage. Of course, we'll have our stage on Hazleton Avenue as well. We'll have uh, five nights or seven nights, I think, at Church of the Redeemer. So there's going to be a lot, cool. a lot going on in the area. Without naming names, have you dealt with anyone? You know, when I'm promoting shows, sometimes you'll get a rider from somebody that will insist on three cases <laughs> of wine, two palm trees, things that are absolutely impossible. What's the what's the, the stupidest thing maybe that you had to fight that wasn't possible? Oh, uh, I see, see. I'm lucky in that I don't deal with the writers directly. That's our director of operations, Patty Marshall. Oh, so Patty she, Marshall has the headaches. A, she is a pro. She knows, know. she knows all that stuff. And and we were chatting about this one. She said, "I've gotten very good at boiling eggs in a hotel kettle, for example." Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she's learned all these sort of tricks of the trade to make sure that you know. Mm -hmm. There's there's often there's there's rarely something that's impossible right we try to make it all happen as much as we can but, but so patty has to look at those original contracts that are actually a rider for a european world tour with a full band yeah, it's, and it's you've got weird. a duo coming into <laughs> yeah, town yeah. who wants the same rider yeah. as a full band touring europe exactly yeah. exactly so here's the sound and the lights and the, and the fog machine and the fans in there, and we look at our stage well we have a 16 by 20 stage so uh <laughs> you don't think we'll so. figure it out <laughs> now what's the thing you're most looking forward to this season coming up right now uh it's so hard to choose just one thing okay maybe maybe a couple a, a few things yeah. so i mean the series of kerner hall that we're doing is great. So we've got three fantastic singers: we've got Emily Claire Barlow in there on the 25th, Omara Portuando from the Bonavista Social Club on the 26th, and then uh, Cecile McLaurin Savant on the 27th. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's that's pretty great. Um, and that's then, a triple treat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, opening weekend the 22nd, we've got Amanda Martinez at Isabel Bader Theater releasing her CD officially. And the same night, we've got Makai McRaven, who's this incredible drummer from Chicago, uh, works with great musicians in the States, but also is connecting to the, the South UK jazz scene, the South London jazz scene in the UK. I mean, just a really exciting drummer, so he's going to be at Adelaide Hall. We've got Ghost Note, Rinse the Algorithm, doing a double bill uh, on the 26th at the Horseshoe Tavern. So, we're, you know, it's just, it's, it's exciting to step back because it can be, feel like a slog. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're in, when I'm in the midst of the programming and there's all kinds of back and forth. And, and you um, know you can't see everything you booked. That's it's it. physically impossible. Oh, that, that's it. So yeah. to step back and look at the schedule and say, okay, between the free shows and the ticketed shows, there's a great variety of music here. And mm -hmm. the free stuff as well. I mean, we've got um, Nubai Garcia who's making huge, uh, huge waves, again, in that South London uh, jazz scene in the UK, but is now starting to break into North America. Uh, Melissa Aldana, who's this incredible Chilean saxophone player but based in New York, coming... She's been out of Berkeley for 10 years now, but is, and is now just absolutely on fire. Uh, Delvon Lamar, who's this incredible organ player from Seattle. So we've got, again, with this many free shows, we're able to bring people in from out of town to sort of highlight some of the artists that they may not be ready for a ticketed show just yet, but we need them on their stages, on our stages, because they're super amazing musicians. Right. And then, of course, like an incredible slate of local musicians as well, from absolutely emerging to the Bernie Senensky septet, you know, um, right. and, and, you know, Larnell Lewis at the end, closing out the festival. So it's, you know, we, we're so blessed in the city to have such incredible musicians. It's always important that we have a, a great representation. And do you have other people who uh, help you with programming on the local scene, or is it because you live here and go out so much that you, someone like Katie George, who a lot of people don't know yet, right, right. she's got a gig there. Yeah. So it, somehow yeah. you have to have your finger on the pulse, or do you just get a whole bunch of submissions. It's it's all of the above. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm constantly trying to reach out to people. I mean, for Katie Georgie, for example, that's that's a partnership with Humber College. So being in touch with the schools is really important because that helps me understand who the 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 up and comers are that are coming out of school now. Yeah. Um, I have an artistic uh, director's advisory committee that that meets semi regularly, and I'm in touch with frequently, just saying on any subject, the, from the biggest names down to the the smallest, uh, the the, mm -hmm. the really emerging local artists. Everyone has an opinion, and it's great to hear from people about what's exciting them uh, musically. Yeah. Uh, the Shad show, for example, that we're doing, I mean, I work directly with Shad's management to curate this thing, uh, to put it together so that Shad's really excited about the artist that he's putting under his banner. Right. I'm really excited because they all sound great, and it sort of hits this jazz meets hip-hop. Mm -hmm. um, this year, 
We've got a very specific emerging artist platform. So every day at 5.30 on the Cumberland stage, you can see a different emerging artist. And I work with Dan Kurtz from uh, The New Deal and, and Dragonette to help, mm -hmm. to help assemble that lineup. Because again, someone like Dan is just connected to the music business in a way that I am not. Yeah. He's, he's hearing and, and interacting with musicians that I'm not in my travels. And so to work together to put that to, to assemble that lineup, it meant that I was drawing on my strengths and Dan was drawing on his strengths and we mashed them all together and, and it's a great nine days of, uh, of emerging artists. It is class. going to be a big one. I, yeah. Congratulations. It's going to be the biggest one yet, no the, doubt. Biggest one yet. Yeah. Yep. All yeah. right. Absolutely. Cheers. Thank Thanks, you. Josh.